Tonight, the severe weather impacting millions. Massive flooding, powerful hurricane level winds and relentless rain. The severe weather that swept across both coasts today causing major collisions and air traffic headaches heading into the holidays. And it all started off as infuriating because it's you're like, what the f like, how are they allowed to do it when other Americans can't. There are massive levels of alleged corruption. Then there are more commonplace practices of purported subversion damaging the country. In tonight's Prime Focus, we introduce you to the everyday people following congressional lawmakers and tracking the very financial trades, making them rich. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the growing pressure on Israel for a ceasefire as Hamas releases a new video of elderly hostages still being held, begging for their release. Plus, the jury rests in the trial of Jonathan Majors, what they decided and word tonight from one of the biggest movie studios in the world about Majors' upcoming projects. And she made history on the Supreme Court. Tonight, the public remembers the life of former former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in Washington. But we do begin with that powerful and destructive East Coast storm that has now turned deadly. Surveillance video captured an E51 tornado near EF1 tornado near Myrtle Beach. The twister leaving behind a path of destruction for miles. The wind and rain also whipping up the surf in Massachusetts. Rain all the way up the I-95 corridor up to a foot in some areas. In the Midwest, lake effect snow in Michigan causing this massive pileup. That monster storm also disrupting travel. Several major East Coast airports saw delays and cancellations ahead of what's expected to be a record holiday travel season. And tonight, bitter cold is headed our way with temperatures expected in the teens and 20s across the Northeast by morning. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano leads us off. Tonight, powerful storms pummeling the Northeast knocking out power for hundreds of thousands, massive trees flattening cars around Boston and punching holes into homes. The power outages across the state now approaching 300,000. I will tell you, there are trees down, there are power lines down. If you don't have to drive, I would just stay home. Connecticut getting slammed. Winds clocked over 60 miles an hour this morning. For the second Monday in a row, the Northeast getting hit with a storm. This one by far worse. Boston Logan Airport issuing a ground stop for hours due to the high winds as delays and cancellations piled up. Roads across the storm zone, no match for up to a half a foot of torrential rain. Drivers stranded in Newark before the sun came up. It's flooded over there, it's flooded over here. Like there's nowhere to go right now at this point. North of New York City, police in Leeds, New York, recovering the body of one person washed away in their car. And authorities in Maine say a man in Wyndham clearing debris was killed by a falling tree. The storms slamming the Carolinas with up to 16 inches of rain. He's floating. Uh oh. Cars floating downstream yeah. in Charleston. Home surveillance cameras catching the moment a confirmed EF1 tornado blew through Myrtle Beach. This shopping center taking a direct hit from 90 mile per hour winds. And in Wake County, North Carolina, authorities say two people were killed on Interstate 87 Sunday after they stopped to help another motorist who hydroplaned off the road. The backside of the system even ramping up lake effect snow in Michigan, multiple pileups and several people hurt along I-94 near Kalamazoo late today. So dangerous out there on the roadways. Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, a blast of Arctic air is now headed east. Time that all out for us. Yeah, it's really coming in behind this thing. And uh, really, we're not quite done with the low itself. It's heading up into northern New England right now. You see the big pulse on the radar and the low-level jet that brought the heaviest winds. That's cranking through Maine for the next several hours. We could see hurricane force wind gusts there. The flood warnings in red ongoing because those rivers and, and streams are running still very, very high. And the winter storm warnings are posted because of that cold air you spoke of. Streaming across the Great Lakes, Lake Effect Snow Machine is cranking. And look at these wind chills in the morning, the core of it getting into the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. 17 for a wind chill tomorrow morning in Nashville and remember folks in the, the east especially without power uh, those are chilly numbers as well in places in, like in the mid-Atlantic. Meanwhile in the west we've got two storms new ones coming in the first one coming in tonight and tomorrow that's kind of a weak one dissipates gets gobbled up by storm number two this one's stronger bigger it looks like it wants to slide down to the south so not an atmospheric river but it's going to be a longer duration event uh, so hopefully not much in the way of flooding, but computer models are pumping out one to four to maybe five inches of rainfall. So that's certainly enough to get some flooding. And uh, the regardless, not ideal weather, be it for travel or otherwise, heading into the Christmas weekend. 
on I either did. coast, sounds like. Okay, Rob Marciano for us, thanks so much. Now to the Israel-Hamas war. Hamas has released images that show three hostages, all seniors pleading for their release. We're also learning new details about the three hostages accidentally killed by the Israeli military. The two were actually waving a white flag to show they were not the enemy. Now U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel urging the IDF to move from high-intensity tactics. ABC's Britt Clement reports from Israel tonight. Tonight, three elderly Israeli hostages pleading for their release in this new Hamas video. The families of 85-year-old Imram Cooper, 79-year-old Kaim Perry and 80-year-old Yoram Metzger asking that we only use a still from the video. It's taking too long and every minute that passing, it, it's, a, it's a huge gambling on my grandpa's life and others' lives. The IDF calling it a criminal terror video, vowing to bring the more than 100 hostages, including Americans, back home. The IDF now saying its rules of engagement weren't followed when Israeli soldiers mistakenly killed three hostages in Gaza. A preliminary report finding Yotam Haim, Alan Shamriz and Summer Al-Talalka were shirtless, waving a white flag, when a soldier shot and killed two of them. Someone was heard crying help in Hebrew. Troops then ordered to stop firing, but the third hostage was shot and killed shortly after. Israel finding these signs near a nearby building where those hostages were believed to have been hiding. One reading SOS, apparently made out of leftover food. Families fearing their relatives held in Gaza could be next. This is a possibility that Israeli soldiers might accidentally kill hostages. Now what we feared finally happened and we feel we're very worried that this is going to happen again. In Gaza, chaos inside the children's ward of a hospital. Moments after an Israeli artillery strike. Rescuers finding the body of 12-year-old Dunya, who was recently orphaned and lost her leg in another strike. Just weeks ago, while recovering, Dunya saying, I only want one thing, for the war to end. And with the Gaza death toll soaring above 19,000, Israel facing growing pressure to shift strategy. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin continuing to urge Israel to move quickly from high-intensity operations to more surgical, targeted strikes on Hamas in Gaza. Britt Lennett joins us now from Israel tonight. And Britt, let's turn to the growing threat to commercial shipping in the Red Sea. Iran-backed Houthi rebels attacked another vessel overnight. How do the U.S. and other nations plan to counter that threat? Yeah, so the Defence Secretary tonight, he announced a new maritime task force with other countries, and really the aim is to make sure that that very critical shipping route is safe. Uh, the attacks are already, Lindsay, causing major economic ripples, uh, sending oil prices surging and prompting some shipping companies uh, like oil giant BP uh, to pause operations. So it's a a bigger problem in the region and the hope is that this task force is going to help solve that and fend off uh, some of those attacks. Lindsay? Britt Kleinett for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Britt. Actor Jonathan Majors has been found guilty of assaulting his ex-girlfriend. A rising star in the Marvel movie franchise, Majors was convicted on misdemeanor counts of assault and harassment. Prosecutors say he and his then-girlfriend got into a heated argument in the car, which then turned violent. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the latest. You're an interesting man. Tonight, actor Jonathan Majors, once a rising star in the Marvel Universe, convicted of domestic violence. A jury in New York finding him guilty of assaulting his then-girlfriend, Grace Jabari. The two were in an SUV back in March when a message from another woman popped up on his phone saying, I wish I was kissing you. Jabari grabbed the phone and said when Majors tried to grab it back, he left her with a fractured finger and a cut behind her ear. Critical to the case, this video showing Majors shoving Jabari back into the car before he takes off with his phone. She chases him, but he pushes her away and runs. Majors later calling 911 after finding Jabari passed out on the floor of their apartment. What happened exactly? Do you know? No, I don't know. Um, uh, but she's unconscious. The jury found Majors did not intentionally assault Jabari, acquitting him of two counts, but determined he acted recklessly, convicting him of two other misdemeanors. Aaron Katursky joins us now. And Aaron, late today we learned about a big announcement. What is Marvel Studios saying after this verdict? 
Marvel, through our parent company, Disney, Lindsay, says it will no longer be going forward with Jonathan Majors. So it's a significant career blow. In addition, when he's sentenced February 6th, Majors faces up to a year in prison based on the conviction on the misdemeanor assault and harassment charges. Though as a first-time offender, Lindsay, it's unlikely he would ever be sentenced that severely. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky for us. Thanks so much, Aaron. Now let's bring in ABC News legal analyst and defense attorney, Mr. Brian Buckmeyer. Always a pleasure to have you here, Brian. You. Uh, obviously a mixed verdict here from the jury. It sounds like in the end that they believed that Jonathan Majors assaulted Grace Jabari, but didn't do so necessarily intentionally. Absolutely. So he's being, he was charged with two misdemeanor assaults, aggravated harassment, and then just ordinary harassment. The difference between the assaults, one was intentional, one was reckless. He was acquitted of the intentional assault, found guilty of the reckless assault, acquitted of aggravated harassment, but found guilty of the harassment. So to your point, the intent didn't seem to be there. You were in the court. You saw the video. Many of us have observed it as well. It sounds like this was key evidence as far as the altercation that happened outside of the vehicle. How did you interpret it, and how do you think the jury saw this video? For me, when I looked at the video, I interpreted it as we understood there was some confusion as to what happened inside, or some debate, sorry. And then we see Jonathan Majors getting out, Grace Jabari pulling him back in. I interpret it as I am taking this woman who is trying to grab at me, putting her back in the vehicle, and I'm running away. I do not want anything to do with this, with this altercation or this incident. But I think the way the jury interpreted this was that putting her back in, that forcing her back into the vehicle, might have been the recklessness that might have mm. caused the injury to the back of the ear or, or some other form of injury. Yeah, because it seemed like he was running away, she was chasing after him. Yeah, and, and that's where the confusion comes. If you are the victim in this case, why are you chasing your abuser for five, six blocks? Jonathan Majors did not testify in his own defense. That's common, really. But in the end, do you think that that helped or hurt him? I think at the time it made the most sense because we, we see this split verdict. So clearly the jury was split in terms of what happened here. There was so much about the toxicity of this relationship that I think if Jonathan Majors did testify, he would have been bogged down in trying to explain all of that only to come to this incident and testify that, I only tried to take my cell phone back. I didn't try to injure her for the intent of injuring her, but to get my property back. But that necessarily wasn't the argument the defense was making. The defense was making that this was about white lies and race and, and about a woman scorned trying to destroy his career. So I think ultimately, probably the smart move not to testify, but hindsight 2020, maybe he's thinking differently today. This is obviously a first offense for majors. What kind of sentencing are you expecting here? So legally, I have to say, it's a class A misdemeanor. You can be punished by up to a year in prison. The way that good time works is max is actually eight months. But you would be hard pressed, if also impossible, to find a first time offender convicted of this charge serving any amount of jail time. I think a year of probation, community service, anger management seems much more uh, appropriate and probably realistic in a case like this. I don't think he'll be in prison, but the fallout from his career and from his the court of public opinion, I think, is what the most damage is going to happen here. Always appreciate your analysis. Brian Buckmeyer, thanks so much. My pleasure. Now to the latest on a security scare that happened just after President Biden was leaving his campaign headquarters in Delaware. A driver slammed his vehicle into an SUV that was part of the president's motorcade. That driver is now under arrest. ABC's chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce reports. Tonight, authorities investigating this frightening moment. President Biden leaving his campaign headquarters in Wilmington, stopping to answer a reporter's question. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the polls? And then suddenly, the sound of a crash. The president stopping in his tracks. The Secret Service then rushing him into his SUV. The First Lady already inside. Reporters on the scene scrambling to see what happened. This car had slammed into a vehicle that was part of the president's motorcade. The driver surrounded. Authorities tonight calling it an accident, saying the driver was drunk. Of all the cars in the world to crash into, Mary Bruce joins us now live from the White House. Mary, uh, what kind of charges is that driver facing and has the president commented about this? Well, that driver has now been charged with driving under the influence and inattentive driving. And tonight we're told the president and the first lady are doing just fine. Lindsay. All right. Glad to hear that. Mary Bruce from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you.
A surge in migrants arriving at the southern U.S. border seeking asylum has fueled disagreements as many Republicans and Democrats demand change. Republicans are now seeking to resolve issues within the immigration system, stalling a bid by the Biden administration to send aid to Ukraine for its war against Russia. The bipartisan talks have focused on who can claim asylum, how asylum should be defined, and what should happen to migrants as they wait for a decision to be made. This year, Republican-led states have shipped buses of migrants to so called safe haven cities, including Chicago and New York, as border crossings continue to skyrocket. Immigration advocates say that U.S. laws that could limit or bar migrants claims are both illegal and immoral. Turning to the race for the White House now, where President Donald Trump said immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country while in New Hampshire over the weekend. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, the Republican candidates for president forced to address Donald Trump's use of language similar to what Adolf Hitler once wrote. Trump declaring immigrants are poisoning the blood of America. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world they're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Only one of Trump's leading Republican rivals denouncing him, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. What he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. In Iowa today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis refusing to criticize Trump for using language reminiscent of Hitler, instead calling it a tactical mistake. So here's the thing. Uh, this border is such a disaster to give them an ability, the opposition an ability to try to make it about something else with, with some of those comments. I just think it, it's just a tactical mistake. Why are we in a situation where we're even having those discussions? South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley often speaks of her experience as a daughter of immigrants. My parents came to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. She didn't mention Trump's comments that immigrants are poisoning the blood of the nation. Her campaign instead releasing this statement saying we need to shut down the border. We don't need chaotic rhetoric that fails to get the job done. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, I understand the Biden campaign released a statement about this. What do they have to say? The Biden campaign says that the former president is channeling his rivals by parroting Hitler, calling him a threat to democracy. And it's worth noting, even though DeSantis calls this a tactical mistake, the former president has used that phrase repeatedly on the campaign trail, and he's ahead of his rivals by 50 points in the polls. Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. Pope Francis has officially signed off on allowing Catholic priests to bless same-sex couples. In a declaration from the Vatican released today, the document goes on to say those seeking a blessing should not be required to have prior moral perfection and that ultimately a blessing offers people a means to increase their trust in God. There are conditions. The blessings are not to be confused with the sacrament of marriage or performed at the same time as a civil ceremony. After weeks of intense earthquake activity, a volcano in Iceland has erupted. Dramatic images seen here show the eruption in the city of Grindavik, a small fishing town on the southern peninsula of Iceland. Thousands of residents near that town are now evacuating. The eruption has also forced the closure of the nearby Blue Lagoon, which is a popular tourist destination. In Brisbane, Australia, more than 300 people were rescued overnight from floodwaters, and now the city is concerned that 160,000 people will lose drinking water. Many residents were seen stranded on their rooftops when rescued. The Queensland State Police Commissioners described the flooding as absolutely devastating. A Category 2 cyclone passed the region last Wednesday. While the strong winds did little damage, the heavy rains continued to drench the area. So far, there have been no deaths or serious injuries reported. Southwest Airlines hit with a massive and record fine. The Department of Transportation ordering the airline to pay $140 million for how it responded to last year's travel meltdown. The DOT says it wants to set a new precedent. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. 
Tonight, the Department of Transportation with a major message heading into the holiday travel rush, levying a historic $140 million fine against Southwest Airlines for how the company responded during last year's travel meltdown. With nearly 17,000 canceled flights, 2 million passengers stranded, the DOT says Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. The Penalty 30 times larger than any other fine the DOT has handed down for consumer protection violations. The agency is also now requiring Southwest to establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours where the airline is at fault. Uh, we have ordered Southwest to lead the industry in passenger compensation. If the entire industry decides to follow suit, so much the better. Lindsay, Southwest says it will be rolling out this new voucher plan by the end of April, and the Department of Transportation is exploring ways to roll this out with all airlines, but that will take a lengthy federal process. Lindsay. Trevor, thank you. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Parenting advice YouTuber Ruby Frankie pleads guilty to child abuse, how much time she could spend behind bars. Plus, lawmakers in Washington have long faced accusations of trading on closed door information. And tonight's Prime Focus will introduce you to an online movement of internet sleuths tracking the market moves of members of Congress trying to get in on the action. It all started off as infuriating. How are they allowed to do it when other Americans can't. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. In the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America America's number one early morning news on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Members of Congress have long faced accusations of trading on closed door information. ABC's Jail Bryant introduces us to a new generation of online detectives tracking and exposing those lawmakers' trades for the world to see and pushing for change. Sunny Santa Monica, California, seemingly a world away from Washington, D.C., is where we found Chris Josephs and his different morning routine. Every day, Chris wakes up, makes a cup of coffee, and then alongside fellow internet sleuths, sifts through the stock trades members of Congress make. It all started off as infuriating, because it's, you're like, what the f Like, how are they allowed to do it when other Americans can't? As long as a trade is reported before 45 days, there's no law preventing members of the House or Senate from trading stocks, even if the bills they pass or committees they sit on could influence a company's stock price. Outraged at first, Chris then saw an opportunity to get in on the action. He moved out west and with three friends launched the app Autopilot, 
It lets users follow a politician's trades and then copy them, automatically buying or selling the same stock a lawmaker does at whatever dollar amount they like. So That's where the money is? Yeah. The reason why we initially set out with the politicians was because they were killing it. They were killing it? They were killing it. Yeah, they were making a lot of the money. You're trying to get in on the money? I'm trying to get in on the money, yep. At what point does this become illegal? The company now has users dedicating tens of millions trying to grow their own bank accounts by mimicking lawmakers' market moves. But the app has also become a rallying cry for a new generation of investors, pointing out what they say is a rigged system that lets a group of 535 men and women with serious political influence buy and sell stocks in the first place. Legally, lawmakers can't trade on inside information, meaning details out of the hands of the general public. But a hypothetical senator could vote for an infrastructure bill and then buy stock in a company that was publicly awarded a project to build a bridge in their district. They could even sit on the Armed Services Committee and trade in the stock of a defense contractor receiving a sizable government contract. Potential conflicts of interest that in the past few years, thousands online began relishing pointing out were all legal. This is a red flag. And the biggest name doing that isn't a name at all, or even a face. What should we call you? What do you go by? Uh, you're welcome to call me uh, Wales, Mr. Wales. A finance guy who started poring over members of Congress's trades when he was bored during the early months of the pandemic, he goes by the full moniker, Unusual Wales, and asks that we not use his real name or show his face, fearful of blowback from the politicians whose trades he dissects and now publishes on his website and on popular social media accounts. Track Congress members' trades at unusualwhales.com. A whale being another term for a big investor, unusual because of the strange success of the traders he tracks. Wales's data finds members of Congress's stock portfolios consistently beat the S&P 500. One thing people always say is that, that members are very good at picking stocks. That's often assumed, but to be, to be quite frank, is that members are also quite good at avoiding losses. One example Wales pointed us to was the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the regional banking crisis. Then, some lawmakers on key congressional committees that govern the financial system dumped SVB and other bank stocks during the turmoil, many before their price plummeted. Not illegal, Wales says, but eyebrow-raising. Uh, I would say there's not as much transparency as one would believe, uh, especially given that many of these members sit on committees that have direct oversight over many of these, these companies. And those new calls for transparency have spurred some in Congress to try again to ban their colleagues from trading stocks altogether. A political movement that's made for some unusual alliances, like a bill co-sponsored by far-right firebrand Matt Gates and progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We have access to sensitive information and to think that a person could then purchase individual stock and make bets and trades and personally benefit from that is, I think, in direct conflict with the public service, the spirit of public service that we're here to do. And then there's the duo from Colorado, Republican Ken Buck and Democrat Joe Neguse, who signed a letter with 19 other Republicans and Democrats pushing congressional leaders to do something about stock trading. Why ban? members of Congress from trading stocks? Because it appears to be uh, unethical, and it is wrong fundamentally, and the American people know it's wrong. The American people expect members of Congress to be serving the American people and the American public and not their stock portfolios. Several lawmakers we spoke with who declined to go on camera said their trades are handled by financial advisors and made often without their knowledge. And others said that trading stocks shouldn't be banned because doing so would cut off a financial source that some politicians use to make ends meet. What do you say to those of your colleagues? Stop whining. You know, we, we, we signed up for this job. We knew what the pay was. It isn't a, um, we're going to pay you this much plus corruption. Corruption is what Congress first tried to tackle 10 years ago, passing the Stock Act. That was the law that officially banned members of Congress from trading with non-public information. But there are still accusations some members of Congress 
do exactly that. Have you both become aware of colleagues of yours that are bending the rules with their trades? Look, I'm going to keep this bipartisan. Uh, I am not going to go into some names. Uh, we both know the names of some people that have made uh, millions of dollars off of trading, uh, spouses trading uh, stocks uh, while committee hearings are going on. One prominent lawmaker whose finances are consistently under a microscope is former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who's disclosed millions of dollars of profit from trades over the years, many made by her husband, a financier. Now let's take a look at where this really all began, the famous Pelosi tracker. And a popular social media account called the Pelosi Stock Tracker now posts to hundreds of thousands of followers the trades the former Speaker discloses. Behind the scenes, it's run by Chris Josephs in an attempt to market his app Autopilot. It all started two years ago when Chris and his friends put $20,000 in a portfolio designed to match every trade Pelosi disclosed. How'd that portfolio do? Pretty well. Now, Chris says Autopilot has $10 million of user money dedicated to just following the trades the former speaker reports. It seems like proving it is the hardest thing, proving whether they're trading off of public or non-public information. Yes, but does it matter? Like, that's the big question. Does it matter? Should You're they be they doing be trading it? They shouldn't be trading in the first place. In a statement, Pelosi's office told us she does not own any stocks herself and has no prior knowledge or subsequent involvement in any transactions made by her husband. A spokesperson added she was fully supportive of an attempt by Congress in 2022 to address members' stock trading, efforts which, despite public pressure, failed. Fast forward to 2023, and a slate of similar bills are seeing the same resistance. It has taken longer than we certainly would have liked, but we're going to continue to push forward. More and more members uh, have joined in this effort uh, than perhaps ever before. There are four or five bills out there with really good ideas in each one of them. They've got to be brought together. There are four or five bills out there, but none of them are going anywhere right now. They're all stuck in various committees. Hey, welcome to Congress. But far away from Capitol Hill, if you listen to Unusual Wales or Chris Josephs, no one is quite sure your elected representatives will voluntarily cut themselves off from a payday. I, I don't think they'll ban it. I think it's all a smokescreen. I, I genuinely don't think they'll do it because it doesn't benefit them. You're saying there's too much money on the table to give it up. I, I think so, <laughs> which is wild to say, but yeah. A really eye-opening report there from J. O'Brien. Our thanks to him. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, police in Texas capture an escaped inmate. What well, we're now learning about who helped him get out in the first place. But next, members of the public pay respects to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, now lying in repose at the Supreme Court, her life and legacy by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, Sandra Day O'Connor lies in repose at the U.S. Supreme Court. A private funeral will be held tomorrow at the National Cathedral, where President Biden is among those delivering eulogies. As the trailblazer is memorialized in the nation's capital, we pay tribute to the first woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court, by the numbers. 1981, the year Sandra Day O'Connor was named the first female jurist to the U.S. Supreme Court by then President Ronald Reagan. The landmark appointment ended 191 years of male exclusivity on the court's bench. O'Connor, a mother to three sons, would remain the only sitting female justice for more than a decade until 1993. The Arizona native would go on to serve 25 years on the U.S. Supreme Court bench before she retired in 2006 at the age of 75 during her husband's struggle with Alzheimer's disease. In 2009, O'Connor was recognized for her lifetime accomplishments. She was awarded the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom by then President Barack Obama. Today, all nine current Supreme Court justices paid tribute to the late justice, where Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about O'Connor's nearly 700 opinions in controversial cases which span the death penalty, affirmative action, and abortion. Justice Sotomayor called O'Connor her life role model and said she approached every case with incredible thoughtfulness and sought to arrive at a practical conclusion. O'Connor died on December 1st from complications tied to advanced dementia and respiratory illness. She was 93 years old. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The airport emergency that sent several flight attendants to the hospital. Plus why Apple is halting sales of new models of its smartwatch. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives and the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. 
We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A plea deal for a YouTube parenting influencer charged with child abuse. Flight attendants rushed to the hospital after an exposure at an airport, and Apple is halting sales of its latest smartwatch. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. The mother famous for giving parenting advice on YouTube pleaded guilty to charges of child abuse in Utah. I'm not even gonna let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. Prosecutors accuse Ruby Frankie and business partner Jody Hildebrandt of abusing and starving two of Frankie's six children. Her 12-year-old son escaped from Hildebrandt's home, asking a neighbor to call 911. Authorities say the children were bound and malnourished. The Utah mother is now expected to take a plea deal after being charged with six counts of felony child abuse. Frankie will testify against Hildebrandt, who has pleaded not guilty to similar charges. In Texas, they have recaptured an inmate after an audacious escape from a prison near Houston. That convict serving life without parole for child sex abuse. Police say Robert Yancey escaped the prison near Houston on Sunday with the help of his mother and the mom's boyfriend driving him away. It took 24 hours to capture him. Members of the public spotted Yancey and then called police. His mother and her boyfriend also arrested and charged. Yancey now faces additional charges. Investigators trying to find Find out how he escaped. Over the weekend, three flight attendants for Spirit Airlines were hospitalized after being exposed to mystery fumes at the airport in Atlantic City. Authorities say they were overcome inhaling fumes during the pre-flight check inside the plane. Investigators have still not found the source of the fumes. One of the nation's largest mortgage providers was hit by a massive data breach. Mr. Cooper, a major mortgage servicer and home loan giant hit by hackers in late October with the personal information of some 14 million customers stolen. The company says the hacking targeted technology systems that held customer names, addresses, dates of birth, phone, social security, and bank account numbers. Affected customers are being notified and will get two years of free credit monitoring and identity theft protection. The CEO of the Mr. Cooper Group releasing a statement apologizing for the concern and frustration and promising to 
make this right for customers. Apple is halting sales of its latest Apple Watches. Sales of the latest Apple Watches, the Series 9 and the Ultra 2, are set to stop this Thursday. It's all because of the device's blood oxygen sensor known as a pulse oximeter, which is the subject of a patent dispute with the medical device maker Massimo. In October, the U.S. International Trade Commission found Apple violated the patent Massimo holds for that sensor. Apple says it strongly disagrees, but that it's preemptively taking steps to comply should the ruling stand. The Biden administration reviewing the ruling. Graduation is a big day for anyone, but for 24-year-old Grace Shimchak, she was holding on to more than just her diploma. That's her 10-day-old baby nestled between her robe. As the Michigan mom received her diploma in early childhood education from Ferris State University, Grace says her baby Annabelle's delivery came early, but she was still determined to make it to that commencement stage to inspire other moms to go back to school. And her husband, 18-month-old, and of course, her newborn were all there for her big moment. An earthquake in northwestern China has killed at least 95 people. The country's state media reports the 6.2 magnitude earthquake hit the region late Monday evening just before midnight. Nearly all of the deaths occurred in the province of Gansu with another nine fatalities in a neighboring province. More than 200 people were injured. A heartbreaking update tonight about Celine Dion's battle with stiff person syndrome. Her sister gave an interview in Canada saying the Canadian singer no longer has control over her muscles. The condition is an incurable neurologic disorder which forced the Grammy winner to cancel her world tour last year. She still plans to return to the stage. And now we turn to a JMA3 exclusive. ABC's DeMarco Morgan sits down with police sergeant Greg Capers, who shot an 11-year-old boy in his home. In May, Darian Murray was shot and wounded by Sergeant Capers during a domestic disturbance call at the home of the Murray's family. The Mississippi Attorney General's office declined to bring charges against Capers for the shooting after the grand jury found that Sergeant Capers did not engage in criminal conduct when he shot and wounded the unarmed 11-year-old boy. Here's some of what Capers said in that interview. So let me ask you this, Sergeant. For those who say having a badge comes with a ton of responsibility and they believe you acted poorly that day. Well, you know, it's, people have their own opinion and unless they're in our shoes, you never know exactly what you may run into or encounter on a day's time within your 12-hour schedule. You just never know what you may run into. Spare the moment. It's a split decision that has to be made. Have you thought about that little boy since that day? All the time. All the time. Thanks to DeMarco for that. And you can watch the exclusive interview airing on GMA3 tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. Tis the season for iconic holiday tunes, and no one does it better than classical crossover multi-platinum group El Devo. The male quartet has earned 50 number one hits and 106 gold and platinum records throughout 35 countries with songs recorded in Spanish, Italian, French, Portuguese, Latin, English, and Japanese. Now as they welcome a new permanent member to the group, they're on their a New Day holiday tour touting the new Christmas EP, a Merry Little Christmas. Our Will Gans got a chance to sit down with the group to talk about their tour and a brand new album coming next year. Guys, thank you so much for being here, for adding one more tour stop to your very busy <laughs> holiday schedule. I really appreciate it. Tell me a little bit about this tour in particular. We've recorded the Christmas album almost 20 years ago. And uh, now that we've recorded this summer our 20th anniversary album, Double X, we thought, while we're in the studio, why don't we record a couple of extra Christmas tracks? It's just a completely different vibe so far. It's El Divo, it's El Divo's music, you know, with um, a lot of... Amor y pasión, you know, with a lot of passion and drama. <laughs> David, were there any songs that you were like, we can't leave this one on the cutting room floor. I mean, how was that process like? You know, it was really more like just trying to figure out what was going to be different from our, our first Christmas album, which that album has a lot of um, religious connotations and not necessarily Christmas music per se. So we wanted to have a feel that was really kind of American, Americana, you know, 
1950s Christmas feel. I think the songs that we picked, they, they really reflect kind of the joy and the fun and the, the family of the season. How did you narrow down what the four were going to be that were going to be this gift to your fans this year? The way that we've chosen the songs is by voting. You know, each of us, we were like, we had a list of songs. We put a playlist together and we were, um, I think in Belgium or something like that, we were listening to all the songs. We, and we played the game yes or no, like without having going to go into explanations. And we managed to narrow it down to four songs. I love that. Speaking of family, you're kind of the new kid on the block, <laughs> Stephen. What has it been like joining this group who's you know been a part of the pop culture lexicon for 20 years now? I mean, were you nervous? What was it like becoming a part of this family? When Carlos went into hospital, it was a, uh, it was more like um, originally, you know, hey, would you maybe uh, step in for him while he's recovering? And then he suddenly passed away, and it was so unexpected for everyone, but it only seemed natural for me to come in, uh, or for someone to come in and, and help memorialize him. You know, it's wonderful to make music with these guys. It's wonderful to collaborate. We have a great working relationship, and a uh, great relationship as friends, too. So it's nice to, you know, be part of something uh, that, as David always says, is bigger than yourself, you know? I mean, you have to click, you have to get along to be on the road as often as you all yeah. are, and, you know, cramped quarters, I'm sure, sometimes, and, and, and all of that stuff. But I'm glad you brought up the, the 20th anniversary album that comes out in February. What is the secret to being around that long? Well, on a musical level, I think it is that our music is and has always been absolutely timeless. You know, we were always focusing on making something beautiful. We were taking songs from all over the, you know, I would almost say the last century of popular music, you know, and we've turned that kind of, we've moved that stuff into our universe and made our own versions of it. But it's not focused on what's hot at the moment and what's not, you know, it's just music you can listen to and enjoy now just like 20 years ago, just like in 20 years from now. Okay, so I have a little bit of a Christmas, like, lightning round. The best Christmas song of all time. The most wonderful time of the year. Period. Mm. Steven, if you could eliminate any Christmas song from existence, what song gets the chop? Santa Baby. <gasps> no! <gasps> what? <laughs> Baby. I'm here for the shock value. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Okay. So drama? I'm, I'm, just kid, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, I like to drama. say angels we have heard on high. <laughs> I mean, another bold choice. I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm here for the shock value. <laughs> I think any choice is going to be a bold choice. All the Christmas songs are, you know, yeah. beloved. Beloved. There are a couple that, like, I don't know. I don't want to get myself in any hot no, water don't, here. Don't, don't, don't. Don't be don't drama. drama Do it for the plot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. David, what automatically gets an audience member on the naughty list if they're at your show? Well, I think what's interesting about our fans is that as we go from country to country, every uh, demographic, every kind of uh, insular cultural uh, difference that we notice going from country to country. Everyone expresses their appreciation differently. Mm -hmm. You know, when we go to Japan, they're supremely respectful. For the first couple of years that we went there, they didn't clap because in their culture, clapping disturbs the silence that the music fades into and that's respectful to hold the silence around the music. But then we go to South America where people are just bazonkers crazy and yeah. climb up on stage with us. Everyone makes the nice list. Yeah. Everyone is nice. Oh, we like it, Nadi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to ask about the cover you guys released of Crazy by Gnarls Barkley. <laughs> I was like, there's no way this is this, the correct crazy. And then I started listening, and it is. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Where did that idea come from, and why does it work as well as it does? Does that make me crazy? There's like a really specific type of music that I like to listen to, and I actually, you know, I, I shared some of that with, with Seb, and I was like, this music is what gets me, all these tiny little details, and he was really on board with like wanting to create this kind of like modern sounds with the songs, and with a lot of the songs that we have on the Double X album. And so that was kind of like, um, Crazy was the first one that was, that was produced. And the version is, as you know, um, it's a silly green, right, that used to sing it, right, but it's super fast. Why don't we just do the opposite and take it really slow 
and add some sound to it that are very modern, but still using the orchestra. The EP is out now. You're on tour as we speak. Double X out in February. What else? Tell, talk to me about this this new single that you've just dropped. Yeah, so uh, we have this new single that just came out. It is incredible. No tengo nada, nada, nada. One of my favorite songs in the album, I Have Nothing, uh, you know, Whitney Houston. We had to add a little bit of Whitney to the album because I feel like that's what Il Divo does best <laughs> is some big, belty music. And actually, uh, we decided we wanted to do it in Spanish. Wow. Incredible. You took Whitney, you made it your own. A bold choice, but if anyone can do it, it's you four. That was amazing. Congratulations on the tour, on the EP, on the album that we're all looking forward to. Thank you, guys. Our right, thanks to Il Devo and Will Gans for that. And you can catch Il Devo on tour now with tickets available at ildevo.com. And their 20th anniversary album, Double X, is set for release on February 9th, wherever music is sold. A group of three moms in a high-risk maternity unit found a special bond when each of them was about to deliver twins. But they all were experiencing the same medical condition, one that's incredibly rare. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has their story. It was really hard to kind of swallow the fact that, you know, this is not going to be anything what I imagined it to be. For Summer Morrison, the summer of 2022 was a scary time. She was admitted to a high-risk maternity unit with an incredibly rare twin pregnancy, monoamniotic twins, where identical twins share the same amniotic sac. Just a few weeks into her stay, Kiara Davis was admitted with the same condition. I tried to give her, you know, some of the things I wish I knew when I got there. That was really helpful because I was like, whew, uh, it's finally somebody that's going through the same thing that I'm going through. Monoamniotic twins occur in less than 0.1% of all pregnancies. Both Summer and Kiara were second time moms, but were not prepared for the intricacies of such a high risk pregnancy involving hospitalization at 26 weeks and constant monitoring of the twins. Just knowing like we weren't doing this alone and that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Summer gave birth to her healthy twin girls on July 20th, 2022. And just a few days later, Kiara received a knock at her door from Vakoya Miller, who had just been admitted with the same condition. All three women receiving their care from Atrium Health. I asked her a million questions, like how has it been so far? Please give me like, all of your advice on staying sane. And I was like, you can sit on the bed if you want to. You can get comfortable. We can just talk about it and express ourselves to each other. Kier giving birth to two healthy girls on August 19th, 2022, and Vakoya on September 28th. All six babies now thriving. Getting to know that there are two other moms that were in the hospital around the same time as me. And even when I got to the hospital, Summer had already delivered, and it just made me grateful for the advice that both of you gave me. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. It's just like a bond you can't make up. It's just, just awesome. So glad to hear moms and babies are all doing well. Our thanks to Eva for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. the next hour, a powerful storm barreling up the East Coast, slamming states with torrential rain and heavy wind, the damage left behind, and the latest on the storm track. Plus, what we're learning about the driver in that car crash involving the presidential motorcade. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Thank <laughs> you.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News live weeknights wherever you stream your news. California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the severe weather impacting millions, massive flooding, powerful hurricane-level winds, and relentless rain, the severe weather that swept across both coasts today, causing major collisions and air travel headaches heading into the holidays, plus a growing pressure on Israel for a ceasefire as Hamas releases a new video of elderly hostages still being held, begging for their release. The jury rests in the trial of Jonathan Majors. What the jury decided and were tonight from one of the biggest movie studios in the world about Majors' upcoming projects. But we do begin with that powerful and destructive East Coast storm that has now turned deadly. Surveillance video capturing an EF-1 tornado near Myrtle Beach. The twister leaving behind a path of destruction for miles. The wind and rain also whipping up the surf in Massachusetts. Rain all the way up the I-95 corridor, up to a foot of rain in some areas. In the Midwest, lake effects snow in Michigan causing this massive pileup. That monster storm also disrupting travel. Several major East Coast airports saw delays and cancellations ahead of what's expected to be a record holiday travel season. And tonight, bitter cold is headed our way with temperatures expected in the teens and 20s across the Northeast by morning. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano leads us off. Tonight, powerful storms pummeling the Northeast knocking out power for hundreds of thousands, massive trees flattening cars around Boston and punching holes into homes. The power outages across the state now approaching 300,000. I will tell you, there are trees down, there are power lines down. If you don't have to drive, I would just stay home. Connecticut getting slammed. Winds clocked over 60 miles an hour this morning. For the second Monday in a row, the Northeast getting hit with a storm. This one by far worse. Boston Logan Airport issuing a ground stop for hours due to the high winds as delays and cancellations piled up. Roads across the storm zone, no match for up to a half a foot of torrential rain. Drivers stranded in Newark before the sun came up. It's flooded over there, it's flooded over here. Like there's nowhere to go right now at this point. North of New York City, police in Leeds, New York, recovering the body of one person washed away in their car. 
And authorities in Maine say a man in Wyndham clearing debris was killed by a falling tree. The storms slamming the Carolinas with up to 16 inches of rain. He's floating. Uh oh. Cars floating downstream yeah. in Charleston. Home surveillance cameras catching the moment a confirmed EF1 tornado blew through Myrtle Beach. This shopping center taking a direct hit from 90 mile per hour winds. And in Wake County, North Carolina, authorities say two people were killed on Interstate 87 Sunday after they stopped to help another motorist who hydroplaned off the road. The backside of the system even ramping up lake effect snow in Michigan, multiple pileups and several people hurt along I-94 near Kalamazoo late today. So dangerous out there on the roadways. Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, a blast of Arctic air is now headed east. Time that all out for us. Yeah, it's really coming in behind this thing. And uh, really, we're not quite done with the low itself. It's heading up into northern New England right now. You see the big pulse on the radar and the low-level jet that brought the heaviest winds. That's cranking through Maine for the next several hours. We could see hurricane force wind gusts there. The flood warnings in red ongoing because those rivers and, and streams are running still very, very high. And the winter storm warnings are posted because of that cold air you spoke of streaming across the Great Lakes. Lake effect snow machine is cranking. And look at these wind chills in the morning, the core of it getting into the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. 17 for a wind chill tomorrow morning in Nashville and remember folks in the, the east especially without power uh, those are chilly numbers as well in places in, like in the mid-Atlantic. Meanwhile in the west we've got two storms new ones coming in the first one coming in tonight and tomorrow that's kind of a weak one dissipates gets gobbled up by storm number two this one's stronger bigger it looks like it wants to slide down to the south so not an atmospheric river but it's going to be a longer duration event uh, so hopefully not much in the way of flooding, but computer models are pumping out one to four to maybe five inches of rainfall. So that's certainly enough to get some flooding. And uh, the regardless, not ideal weather, be it for travel or otherwise, heading into the Christmas weekend. On Indeed. either coast, sounds like. Okay, Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much. Now to the Israel-Hamas war. Hamas has released images that show three hostages, all seniors, pleading for their release. We're also learning new details about the three hostages accidentally killed by the Israeli military. The two were waving a white flag to show they were not the enemy. Now U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel urging the IDF to move away from high-intensity tactics. ABC's Britt Clement reports from Israel tonight. Tonight, three elderly Israeli hostages pleading for their release in this new Hamas video. The families of 85-year-old Imram Cooper, 79-year-old Kaim Perry and 80-year-old Yoram Metzger asking that we only use a still from the video. It's taking too long and every minute that passing, it, it's, a, it's a huge gambling on my grandpa's life and others' lives. The IDF calling it a criminal terror video, vowing to bring the more than 100 hostages, including Americans, back home. The IDF now saying its rules of engagement weren't followed when Israeli soldiers mistakenly killed three hostages in Gaza. A preliminary report finding Yotam Haim, Alan Shamriz and Sama Al-Talalka were shirtless, waving a white flag, when a soldier shot and killed two of them. Someone was heard crying help in Hebrew. Troops then ordered to stop firing, but the third hostage was shot and killed shortly after. Israel finding these signs near a nearby building where those hostages were believed to have been hiding. One reading SOS, apparently made out of leftover food. Families fearing their relatives held in Gaza could be next. This is a possibility that Israeli soldiers might accidentally kill hostages. Now what we feared finally happened and we feel we're very worried that this is going to happen again. In Gaza, chaos inside the children's ward of a hospital. Moments after an Israeli artillery strike. Rescuers finding the body of 12-year-old Dunya, who was recently orphaned and lost her leg in another strike. Just weeks ago, while recovering, Dunya saying, I only want one thing, for the war to end. And with the Gaza death toll soaring above 19,000, Israel facing growing pressure to shift strategy. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin continuing to urge Israel to move quickly from high-intensity operations to more surgical, targeted strikes on Hamas in Gaza. Britt Glennett joins us now from Israel tonight. And Britt, let's turn to the growing threat to commercial shipping in the Red Sea. Iran-backed Houthi rebels attacked another vessel overnight. How do the U.S. and other nations plan to counter that threat? 
Yeah, so the Defence Secretary tonight, he announced a new maritime task force with other countries, and really the aim is to make sure that that very critical shipping route is safe. Uh, the attacks are already, Lindsay, causing major economic ripples, uh, sending oil prices surging and prompting some shipping companies uh, like oil giant BP uh, to pause operations. So it's a, a bigger problem in the region, and the hope is that this task force is going to help solve that and fend off uh, some of those attacks. Lindsay? Britt Klein had for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Britt. Actor Jonathan Majors has been found guilty of assaulting his ex-girlfriend. A rising star in the Marvel movie franchise, Majors was convicted on misdemeanor counts of assault and harassment. Prosecutors say he and his then-girlfriend got into a heated argument in the car, which then turned violent. ABC News legal analyst Brian Buckmeyer is helping to break down this verdict. But first, let's begin with ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. You're an interesting man. Tonight, actor Jonathan Majors, once a rising star in the Marvel Universe, convicted of domestic violence. A jury in New York finding him guilty of assaulting his then-girlfriend, Grace Jabari. The two were in an SUV back in March when a message from another woman popped up on his phone saying, I wish I was kissing you. Jabari grabbed the phone and said when Majors tried to grab it back, he left her with a fractured finger and a cut behind her ear. Critical to the case, this video showing Majors shoving Jabari back into the car before he takes off with his phone. She chases him, but he pushes her away and runs. Majors later calling 911 after finding Jabari passed out on the floor of their apartment. What happened exactly? Do you know? No, I don't know. Um, uh, but she's unconscious. The jury found Majors did not intentionally assault Jabari, acquitting him of two counts, but determined he acted recklessly, convicting him of two other misdemeanors. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Now to the latest on a security scare that happened just after President Biden was leaving his campaign headquarters in Delaware. A driver slammed his vehicle into an SUV that was part of the president's motorcade. That driver is now under arrest. ABC's chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce reports. Tonight, authorities investigating this frightening moment. President Biden leaving his campaign headquarters in Wilmington, stopping to answer a reporter's question. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the polls? And then suddenly, the sound of a crash. The president stopping in his tracks. The Secret Service then rushing him into his SUV. The First Lady already inside. Reporters on the scene scrambling to see what happened. This car had slammed into a vehicle that was part of the president's motorcade. The driver surrounded. Authorities tonight calling it an accident, saying the driver was drunk. Our thanks to Mary Bruce. Turning now to the race for the White House, where President Donald Trump said immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country while in New Hampshire over the weekend. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, the Republican candidates for president forced to address Donald Trump's use of language similar to what Adolf Hitler once wrote. Trump declaring immigrants are poisoning the blood of America. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world they're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Only one of Trump's leading Republican rivals denouncing him, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. What he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. In Iowa today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis refusing to criticize Trump for using language reminiscent of Hitler, instead calling it a tactical mistake. So here's the thing. Uh, this border is such a disaster to give them an ability, the opposition an ability to try to make it about something else with, with some of those comments, I just think it, it's just a tactical mistake. Why are we in a situation where we're even having those discussions? South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley often speaks of her experience as a daughter of immigrants. My parents came to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. She didn't mention Trump's comments that immigrants are poisoning the blood of the nation. Her campaign instead releasing this statement saying we need to shut down the border. We don't need chaotic rhetoric that fails to get the job done. 
Thanks to Rachel Scott for that. Southwest Airlines hit with a massive and record fine. The Department of Transportation ordering the airline to pay $140 million for how it responded to last year's travel meltdown. The DOT says it wants to set a new precedent. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, the Department of Transportation with a major message heading into the holiday travel rush, levying a historic $140 million fine against Southwest Airlines for how the company responded during last year's travel meltdown. With nearly 17,000 canceled flights, 2 million passengers stranded, the DOT says Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. The Penalty 30 times larger than any other fine the DOT has handed down for consumer protection violations. The agency is also now requiring Southwest to establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours where the airline is at fault. Uh, we have ordered Southwest to lead the industry in passenger compensation. If the entire industry decides to follow suit, so much the better. Our thanks to Trevor. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, pianist, composer, and producer Chloe Flower joins us in studio. She tells us about her new Christmas album and how she found that holiday sound. But next, the dramatic rescues from out-of-control floodwaters in Australia. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Officials in Iran confirm a cyber attack has crippled more than 4,000 gas stations there. Thousands have been restored, but at one point, Iran State TV said roughly 70% of the country's gas pumps were out. Iran State TV says a group called Predatory Sparrow has claimed responsibility. The same group attacked Iran's railroads and fuel pumps two years ago. Some Iranian media claim the hacker group is Israeli-linked. In Brisbane, Australia, more than 300 people were rescued overnight from floodwaters. Many were seen stranded on rooftops. Now the city is concerned that 160,000 people will lose drinking water. The Queensland State Police Commissioners described the flooding as absolutely devastating. A Category 2 cyclone passed the region last Wednesday. There have been no deaths or serious injuries reported. Pope Francis has officially signed off on allowing Catholic priests to bless same-sex couples. In a declaration from the Vatican released today, the document goes on to say those seeking a blessing should not be required to have prior moral perfection 
and that ultimately a blessing offers people a means to increase their trust in God. There are conditions, though. The blessings are not to be confused with the sacrament of marriage or performed at the same time as a civil ceremony. You have definitely heard the creative voice of our next guest. This Steinway artist has worked with Lil Nas, Babyface, Cardi B, 2 Chains, and Celine Dion, just to name a few. Now, Chloe Flower is out with a piano pop Christmas album showcasing the breadth of her genre bending musicianship. Let's take a listen. Composer, producer, Chloe Flower joins us now in studio. Chloe, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you're out with your second album, a Christmas album, and this has all the familiar holiday songs, but you take a different spin. How, when you were in the studio, did you envision going in this different direction? You know, Christmas is kind of the perfect musical project for me to, you know, navigate between tradition, whether it's like traditional melodies or classical music and innovation, like my my actual sound. So I was super excited. I want people to like listen to my music and be like, oh, that's Chloe Flower, even mm -hmm. though there's no vocal. So that was kind of the goal in the studio. And I didn't want it to all be happy because, you know, the holidays aren't happy for everyone. So I that's wanted right. there to be, you know, ebbs and flows in and out, you know. How did you decide you wanted to arrange each song? Well, I wanted it to have, I love um, Hollywood and cinematic music so I wanted to definitely have um, that Hollywood old Hollywood sound but I wanted to make sure it was epic and emotional and almost feels like a dream so every song is like really different but they all hopefully sound like me <laughs> I, I love that you call your style popsicle I explain what you mean by that so basically it's always hard it has been to describe my genre right because um, the thing about instrumental music is it's so diverse. So it's not just classical, it's not just pop, it's not just hip hop. And so I would say I love popular music and I love classical, so I just started calling it popsicle. It made sense. It, it totally <laughs> makes sense. It, it feels to me like there has to be somebody who's influenced you, because you have such a unique style. I'm imagining you take in from different pop people, different classical musicians who have inspired you. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I've always been so inspired by classical music, but also also vocal music and it's hard with the piano it doesn't have the vibrato that like a voice or a stringed instrument has but I got a lot of inspiration from Liberace who oh. was one of the the few artists who really crossed over from classical to piano bar to pop he went really mainstream and I loved his he had that old Hollywood sound as well so he was a huge inspiration for me you went to Manhattan School of Music you come from a very strong classical lineage how did you end up producing music and working with people like Cardi B you know I I wanted to stay authentic to myself and really I truly authentically love hip hop and I love pop music and so on social media I was just messing around with covers and just doing my own twist um, to these songs and she found me on Instagram. Classical music often has this air about it right where it's kind of unreachable it's it's very elite but it feels like you have ground it or, or married it well into today's sound? Def you know, about classical music, it, you know, what I've realized growing up in, in the genre itself, um, I was always separated from the audience. And what I've learned going into the pop space was that, you know, the health of the audience and the health of me, de we depend on each other. So I've, I've had such an amazing time opening up from, you know, when I was in school to all of a sudden ex ex experimenting with pop genres, like pop songs and like from the Beatles, Whitney Houston, Mariah, um, even soundtracks from film scores like Indiana Jones. I loved playing. I did a concert with Indiana Jones music and um, that was a way that I was able to touch and connect with audiences that didn't necessarily understand classical music. And so in that way, I, I think that's how I've been able to reach people. And social media has been great in that way that I can just put out a cover and put my own twist on a, a random song and then all of a sudden it resonates and it, that brings them in. I, I'm curious too, when did you know that music was really gonna be your thing? Because I've talked to a number of musicians lately who said that, you know, kind of like we do at our house, like we insist that our son plays, you know, piano and takes those 
lessons and he doesn't necessarily love it. But it, some people say, people say that they transition at some point to saying like, this is my passion. I have known that I've wanted to be a, a pianist since I can remember mm. time. Um, and I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my career is inspire kids like in your family to want to learn an instrument. You know, we're putting out so many sports geniuses and less music geniuses because the demand in schools is not as high for music as it is for sports. And so trying to make it cooler and mm -hmm. trying to approach it in a different way so that these kids are excited to sign up for piano or orchestra. I think you do it so well. You're in front of the piano doing your moves, your dance moves, a little bob. We like that. Chloe Flower, thank you so much for joining us. Want to let our viewers know that you can listen to Chloe Hart it's Christmas anywhere you stream music now. And still to come, it must be in the bloodline, the mother-daughter pair graduating from college together. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. It graduation is a family affair for a mother and daughter in Syracuse, New York. The two are celebrating milestones together. Reporter Jeremy Skiva from our partner station WSYR has their story in our local lowdown. <laughs> Barbara and Tanisha Wiggins aren't your average 2023 graduates. The mother-daughter pair graduating with degrees in human services. It is in the bloodline. We love helping people. We're um, here for everyone, and we just love doing what we love doing. 36-year-old <laughs> Tanisha enrolled in 2007, but decided to drop out after realizing she wasn't ready for college. 58-year-old Barbara enrolled at Onondaga Community College two years ago. I felt young. <laughs> I really did. I felt just young and it, and it was exciting. I was stressed out this last semester, doing all the homework, doing reports, and but it was awesome. And now that it's over, I'm feeling like, you know, I don't want this to end. While their college experience wasn't filled with downing energy drinks and pulling all-nighters, Barbara and Tanisha both made plenty of memories along the way. Studying together. We studied a lot together. Um, we put our ideas together and we made it happen. She'll call me, um, I got a report to do, can you watch the kids? Yeah, I got to do this. Um, we would just, we just worked back and, you know, we just worked together. OCC also honored Barbara's daughter and Tanisha's sister, Alicia, who graduated in 2020, but didn't get to walk across the stage due to COVID. Please join me in congratulating all three Wiggins. <laughs> continuing education in the family. Huge congrats to mom and both daughters. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.